Hi everyone. Welcome to another video in my Accounting for Receivables lecture series. Uh, this video is all about interest-bearing receivables. So we've covered normal accounts receivable, we've covered this idea of uncollectibles and different methods of writing off and different methods of estimating write-offs, and we've talked about various other things that you can do with receivables. What we haven't talked about yet is the fact that there are going to be some assets that you hold that bear interest, that earn you interest. And even though interest is constantly racking up with every second of every day, essentially, as time passes, you only get paid on certain, at, at certain times, right, at certain periods. And so in the meantime, between the time that the, the interest revenue accrues and the time that you get paid, you are going to record interest, uh, uh, interest receivable, right? And so that's what this video is going to be all about, is, is these interest-bearing assets um, and interest-bearing receivables. All right, so let's just talk about it from an overview for a minute. So one of the primary uh, uh, interest-bearing receivables that we have are notes. Um, it's one of the big differences between, say, accounts receivable and, and notes receivable. Um, accounts receivable, typically just normal course of business with a customer, hey, pay in a certain number of days, maybe get a discount. If not, you're due in this many days. Um, there's no thing about like, oh, we're lending you money, and so you owe us interest. That, that doesn't really happen with accounts receivable. Notes receivable, on the other hand, are a, a, a written payment agreement. The, the name comes from, from the word promissory note. Um, so it's, it's basically a, a written promise to pay um, a certain amount of debt in a certain uh, uh, period of time. And, and the thing with notes, though, is that um, in these written contracts, you're typically not getting to pay that money over time for free. There's typically interest involved. And, and so, um, uh, you know, if you're the one that, that is lending somebody the credit, um, you're going to receive that interest. If you're the one borrowing, you're going to pay that interest. But notes usually have interest involved. Um, why would you use a note receivable over accounts receivable? Well, this bullet pretty much sums it up. Um, when lending money outside of normal business standards. Um, so, you know, maybe you're straight up lending cash to someone. You're gonna want that in a, in a documented legal uh, promissory note, right? Um, instead of selling them a product and they pay you later. Um, maybe uh, uh, you, you're selling a, uh, uh, something that is of extremely high value and and so you need to make sure that the buyer is going to uh, stick to the payments something of that nature when you think of um, cars and houses right you you sign notes um, to, to to pay those things over time with with a certain interest rate um, maybe you've got a certain credit limit that you allow customers to have and some customer wants to exceed that limit well you could just maybe trust them if they're a well-known customer but it's more in your favor to well if you're gonna you're gonna go beyond the normal limits that the company establishes let's get that in writing right let's put that in a promissory note so whatever reason you can think of that 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 a lending situation might um, uh, venture beyond normal business terms normal standards or or even just into super high value territory um, uh, that's when you're probably going to turn to a note over say just a regular account uh, receivable so uh, that's one of our interest bearing assets notes receivable another one of our interest bearing assets are, are debt investments um, so so when we lend money to other companies by buying their their debt instruments um, in in the open market usually those debt instruments uh, uh, state some sort of interest that they bear so that's different than equity instruments stock when you buy stock you make your money by the the value of the stock changing in the open market or through dividends received um, when you buy debt instruments you can make some money through price fluctuations but those those debt instruments bear interest and and so some of your money made is, is going to come in the form of, of interest so those are kind of our two main assets they're going to going to uh, drive uh, the receipt of interest. 
just to point out, just so you're aware of, um, you know, if, if you ever see these kind of things um, in a future business class or you ever see one of these notes in real life, um, typically when you're looking at a debt instrument, there are some standard items that are contained on, on every given debt instrument. Um, and, and the terminology differs depending on the type of instrument it is, but but they mean the same thing. So, so for instance, I have here maker slash issuer. If it's a note payable, we're, we're usually dealing with a, a maker. If it's a, 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 a debt instrument in the open market, like a bond, so, so a lot of times you'll just hear me say bonds. That's what I'm talking about when I say like a debt instrument in the open market. We're talking about issuers. Um, but whoever it is, whether you call it the maker or the issuer, what you're talking about is it's the writer of the instrument. It's the person borrowing the money and signing saying, yeah, we, I, I owe you this, okay? Um, then you have the, the payee or the investor, right? If it's a note, it's the payee. If it's a, a, a bond or a debt instrument in the open market, it, it's, it, you're an investor essentially. But, but this is the person who loans the money, the purchaser of the instrument, right? The lender. Um, you're gonna have what's known as the principal or the face value. And that's simply the, the amount uh, loaned or, 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 or borrowed, depending on which side of the transaction you're on, right? Um, uh, in notes, we tend to refer to it as, as the principal on the note. Um, in, in terms of, of, of bonds, um, I won't get into the specifics now because there's a whole lecture series on bonds coming later, um, but, but essentially the bond certificate itself has a face of value to it, um, uh, which represents its its principle. Now, the reason I say I won't get into it now is because um, uh, bonds may not issue for the amount of the face value. And, and so that's beyond the scope of this lecture. Join me for my bond series for that. Um, but just know that, that there is an amount loaned or borrowed or expected to be loaned or borrowed, and that's typically known as the, the principle or the face value. Um, then you have the interest rate. Right, so this is going to be how uh, uh, the lender makes money. It's it's the additional amount owed um, by the borrower on a periodic basis. So it's it's some percent of that principal, basically. So let me write that in here. Actually, um, a percent of principal. So whatever that face value is, whatever that main amount borrowed is, uh, on, on a certain periodic basis, it could be quarterly, it could be monthly, it could be yearly, you have to pay X percent of that principal as interest. Um, and then you've got the due dates and the maturity dates. Um, so due date is typically used in, in terms of a note because a note comes due. Maturity date is typically used in, in, in like a bond. Um, but nonetheless, this is just the date that the principal needs to be repaid. Now, there might be an interest payment on that date as well, but that what that date covers is not interest. That date covers here's when the principal come, comes due. So those are just kind of common components. And, and I just want you to be aware of that because you may see debt instruments in your life. You may see them in other courses. Many of you who are watching this video are my students and you've taken out student loans. So you have signed promissory notes before. These things are on that note if you go look for them. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, I just wanted you to have some knowledge of that. All right, let's get into the actual accounting. So, um, believe it or not, we've already done this. If you're if you're following this video series as, as according to my numbered recommendation, um, you have seen accounting for interest already. You saw it when we did adjusting journal entries. Um, when you get to the end of a period and you have to make adjustments to record revenue or expense in the correct period, one of the things you consider at that time is, did we? earn any interest or or did we incur the cost of any interest and you have to uh, record that portion of interest that goes in that period so um, if you've been with me since adjusting journal entries uh, this is not entirely new believe it or not but uh, that said I'm gonna sort of treat it as new just to make sure it gets fully covered um, I do want to say here uh, right out the gate um, as far as uh, debt investments go um, uh, debt investments follow investment rules. So if you haven't viewed my lecture series on investments, go view that and you'll learn all about how to account for investments. It, it, it is its own hour and something minutes of, of lecture to, to explain that. 
Um, but just know, you know, I, I'm talking about there's basically two different assets that are going to bear interest: the notes receivable and and the and the debt investments. Um, as far as accounting for the debt investment itself, go check out that lecture series, and that'll show you how to account for the investment. I'm going to focus here on the interest, not the investment. Um, the notes receivable. There's not really much to say as far as accounting for the note receivable itself, because when you issue, uh, when when you write a note, um, um, it has a certain principal balance, and it just stays there, right, until the due date when it gets paid off. So as far as accounting for the note goes, there's not much to do beyond the day the money gets lent and the note gets recorded, and then the day the note gets paid off. Um, uh, otherwise, there's really nothing more to it. Interest is the thing that where the complication comes in. So um, as time passes, as I mentioned earlier, you accrue interest revenue. Um, and, and literally it's happening every second of every day that you are loaning somebody money, right? This, this is assuming you're the lender because we're talking about receivables here. We're not talking about the payable side of things. So if you're the borrower, you're on the payable side, but we're, we're simply gonna talk about the revenue side. Um, every second of every day that passes, revenue is accruing. now. Are you going to sit there and have um, a dedicated accountant sitting in a in a cold, dark room with a with with a computer um, every second, quickly typing an accrual for interest revenue? A absolutely not, right? Um, so, but but what you are going to do is when you get to the end of an accounting period, because that's when it really matters. When you get to the end of an accounting period, you're going to say, "All right, how much time passed during this period?" that we earned interest. And you're going to accrue revenue for that period of time when interest was, was accrued. So you're not gonna try to track it every second of every day. You're just gonna make sure when you get to the end of a period that you take care of whatever amount of time passed during that period. Um, but here's the thing, your period end, when you accrue that interest revenue, remember that that's all about earning revenue, right? Time passes, you earn revenue because that's, that's the whole idea of interest. You've loaned somebody money and and the longer they take to pay you back, the more you make. Um, the cash receipts that are agreed to, according to whatever the interest contract is, whether it's a, 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 a bond or a note, whatever, the interest payments may not align with your period end. And so to the extent that you do not receive cash at the time that you record the accrual of revenue, you are instead going to debit interest receivable. Right, and then later on, when you get the cash, you'll take the receivable away, and you'll record the receipt of cash. So, um, it, you know, it's not it's not a difficult concept, um, but you'll see how it kind of plays out. It, it it gets just a little bit more complicated, but it not not, not bad. Um, so, first up, um, interest revenue. You know, I've been talking about it, but I didn't actually spell out the math. Here's the math that if you, if you want to deal with this, interest revenue is simply the principal times the periodic interest rate. So you gotta be careful of how your rate is stated. By default, default is APR, annual percentage rate, okay? That's default. So, so if uh, uh, you see an interest percentage and there is no specification, assume annual. Um, but you might see interest written in other terms. It could be per quarter or per month or whatever the case may be, but often it's just annual, APR. Um, so you take the principal times the periodic interest rate times the portion of period that has gone by, and that will tell you how much revenue you need to accrue. And of course, revenue is a credit. The other side of that is either you receive the cash because somebody's paying you that interest, or you record interest receivable because you're gonna get it later. Um, I do have a note down here just for balance sheet purposes. Um, all receivables are classified as current or long-term assets depending on when they will convert to cash. So you have a note. That note might be a five-year note. Well, that's a long-term asset until you get to year four, right? Because once you're in year four, you're a year away from, from that note becoming cash. Um, and so, so that note's a long-term asset for most of its life, but in the final year will become a current asset. If you record interest receivable um, on that note because you have some interest due, well, whether it is current or long-term is going to depend on when does the interest get paid. 
Is it coming within the next year? Then it's a current asset. Does it wait until the note's maturity to get paid? Then it's a long-term asset until that fourth year when, when the note becomes current as well. So, so you always have to assess, do I put this as a current or a long-term asset, depending on whether or not they're going to be converted to cash um, with, within a year. Uh, obviously, it's within one year or one operating cycle, right, is the technical term. But we just say within one year for simplicity in this class. Okay, let's see it in action. So that there, there's your big abstract view of the world. Let's let's get to the action. How does this really look in practice? So here we have um, Flyer Corps loaned five hundred thousand dollars to Blue Devil Corps on October first, two thousand eighteen, in exchange for a five year note. The note has a stated interest rate of two percent, with interest due every September thirtieth. So. Um, you know, 2%, you can presume here, it's an annual percentage rate, even though it doesn't say the letters APR. Um, it's due every year on September 30th, so that's another indicator. This is an annual rate. And it says, record any adjusting entries required when Flyer Corps' books close on December 31, 2018. All right, so remember what I told you about interest. You earn revenue as time passes, but you don't try to record it every second. You wait till your period is over. So what we need to ask ourselves is, as of December 31, 2018, has time passed in which we earned interest? And if so, we need to figure out what that time is and we need to record interest revenue. In this case, um, we loaned this $500,000 to Blue Devil Corps on October 1st. All right, you count on your fingers. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to keep this portion of the video or not, depending on how much space is on this slide, but I am counting on my finger if you can't see me. October, November, December. I always tell my students, if by exam three, I don't see you counting on your fingers um, during an exam, um, you've either got a better ability to keep track of things in your head than me, or you're just more confident than yourself, or you're just too embarrassed, which you shouldn't be. Like, I should definitely see people counting on their fingers, especially during exam time, because you don't want to make a silly mistake of accidentally miscounting months and losing points for something like that, right? But October, November, December, that's three months. So um, essentially, we've earned three months worth of interest. So we're going to have three months worth of interest revenue. All right, we need to figure out how much that revenue is. Well, the principal is $500,000. So $500,000 times the interest is 2%. So times 2%. So that's going to be, uh, I believe, $10,000. Let's see, 1%. Yeah, times 2, 5,000. 5, Let me just double check that because I don't trust myself on my mental math on this one. For some reason, I feel like I should be able to do 2% in my head. Yeah, $10,000. All right. Um, but that right there, that $10,000, that is interest earned per year. We've only had this note out for three months. And so the way we do that math is we say times three out of 12 months, right? Because 12 months is a year, so that's the total amount. So if we did this times 12 out of 12, right? That would be a full year's worth, that would be 10,000. But we only have it for three out of 12 months. So we said times three out of 12. By the way, if you did my adjusting journal entries um, uh, lecture series, you this is starting to probably feel pretty familiar right about now. Um, and so that one I'm not gonna attempt to do in my head. So I've got my 10,000. 10,000 times three out of 12 comes out to 2,500. And that is three months of interest. Now, specifically, that's revenue we earned because that's time that has passed. So we have our date for our journal entry, 1231. We have a credit to interest revenue for $2,500 coming from the math we just did. We're going to have a debit for $2,500. What do we debit? Well, they owe us cash, but they don't pay that cash until September 30th rolls around. So for the time being, we have a receivable, and we're going to call that interest receivable because that's exactly what the receivable represents. So this is what we do when, when we accrue our revenue and we haven't gotten paid. We record this interest receivable for the portion of, of time that has passed. All right, 
Now let's talk about when we actually get paid. So this is the same problem, all right? The only difference now is I am asking us to um, record the journal entry required when we receive the first interest payment on September 30th, 2019. So we're just gonna fast forward nine months from where we last were. All right, so what happens at that date? Well, remember, that interest payment covers an entire year's worth of interest. So let's back up for a moment, and I am going to copy our math here because we have some special math, and, and it's going to come back to help us out. Um, we determined in this math that we earn $10,000 in interest per year, which gets paid every September 30th, which means on September 30th, we debit cash $10,000 because that's what we are getting paid that day. Now, the common mistake that I see from students is what they do at this point is they write interest revenue $10,000. And that is not correct. Why is it not correct? Well, think about it. We have earned revenue of $10,000 by the time September 30th, 2019 rolls around. But we already recorded revenue of 2,500. We can't record 10,000 more because that would put us at total revenue of 12,500, which we have not earned yet because it's only been one year. Instead, what we need to do is go ahead and collect that interest receivable for 2,500. This comes from the, I'm making note, prior slide. So this is what we recorded on the prior slide, was we recorded a debit to interest receivable. Now they're paying that $2,500 off. That's part of that $10,000. And the difference there is the additional revenue we get to record, $7,500. And that number isn't random, $7,500, because what that number actually represents is nine additional months of interest, January through September. Because remember, we accrued our revenue as of December 31st. So now January, February, March, April, May, all the way to September has passed, or nine additional months. And then if we were to take our math, take our 10,000 times 9 over 12 instead of 3 over 12, we would get 7,500. Okay, so that's, that's where those numbers come from. So this is how the payment date works. Um, if the payment date aligns with period end, even better, because if the payment date aligns with period end, you just debit cash because you're getting paid, credit revenue because you're, you're accruing the revenue, and you're done. But in the event that your payment date doesn't align um, with period end, this is, this is how it works out. You accrue the revenue and a receivable at period end, and then you uh, uh, record the receipt of the receivable plus the additional revenue once you get to the, the payment date. All right, same problem, but we're going to fast forward. Um, it says, uh, record the journal entry required when FlyerCore receives the final note repayment on September 30th, 2023. So this is what's known as our, our due date, or in, if this was a bond, a maturity date. Um, what happens on that day? Well, I can tell you one thing that happens for absolute certain. This $500,000 principal gets paid back. So... Um, 9, 30, 2023, because we're, we're five years in the future from where the problem started, um, we're going to get cash of $500,000. Why are we getting that cash? Well, because we've had this note receivable that we recorded way back at the beginning sitting here this whole time. So let's back up. Um, oh, we never did, sorry, we never did the journal entry for the note receivable. We started with the adjusting entry, so it's not actually there. But anyway, when we first loaned the note, we recorded debit note receivable, credit cash for 500,000. Now we're getting that money back. So this is definitely happening um, on 923, uh, 930, 2023. But if you stopped there, your answer would not be fully correct because something else happens on September 30th, 2023. Something happens every September 30th. And believe it or not, we don't have to do any new math. We don't have to come up with any fancy, you know, okay, we're five years away. Let's do five years of accounting. 
All we have to do is go back to this slide right here. We re-recorded this journal entry on September 30th, 2019, and we just have to copy that over. Except now it's 2023. Because this is what happens with these things. They just follow the same pattern year after year after year. Um, so starting with, with December 31st, 2018, you recorded an accrual of three months of interest revenue and, and three months interest receivable. And guess what? On December 31st, 2019, you're going to do the same thing. And December 31st, 2020, you're going to do the same thing. Why are you constantly doing this? Well, because every September 30th, you're getting paid and you're recording the revenue up to that point in time, which means when you get to your year end at December 31, it's been October, November, December, since you last recorded revenue. So you have three more months of revenue to record. And that means when you get to September again, you're gonna have nine months of revenue plus the payout to record. And that's gonna happen every year on September 30th. So what happens at the final day of the note, the day the principal gets paid back on September 30th, 2023? Well, yeah, you get the principal back, but you also get the final interest payment. Remember, just cycles, year after year after year, it looks the same, okay? That's it, that's how interest bearing, uh, I, I say interest bearing receivables, technically interest bearing assets because it, it, debt investments aren't receivables, but they same same thing. Um, you know, it's it's not hard once you get used to it. And, and it's essentially just putting your adjusting entry skills to the test. We've done other adjusting entries, um, if you've stuck with my videos since then, um, uh, where, we, where we've uh, looked at, oh, well, employees worked for, you know, five days of their two week pay period. And you, so you have to record five days worth of salary and wage expense. We've uh, looked at where you've had depreciation. Um, and, and so it's only been, you know, three months since you bought the piece of equipment. And so it depreciated three out of 12 months worth of its annual depreciation. This is no different. Um, it's just, hey, we've got some interest receivable and uh, how much time has passed and therefore what do we record? And But we take it a step further because whereas with the adjusting journal entries, we stopped there. We just said, what do we record at period end? Now we see the continuation. Well, then what happens when you get to that cash payment? What happens when you get to the next period end? What happens when you get to the next cash payment? Which that's just a loop, right? But then what happens when you get to the final payout? So, so now you've kind of seen the lifespan. Um, for beginning to end rather than simply just here's an adjusting entry you make. So we're getting a little bit more insight into, into how these things work. Um, all right, so that's it for this video. There is one more in the receivables um, lecture series and that is gonna be about managing receivables and performing financial statement analysis on receivables. So make sure you don't miss that one. I hope you found this one helpful and have a great day.